Ezra chapter 8, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. And I think this is something we need to hear. Amen. Because we can get on that road and the road can get weary. Amen. So we're going to talk about a time when, you know, they came back from Babylonian captivity and they were a little slow. The Jews were a little slow rebuilding the walls. And that wasn't wise, but they were just sort of just focused on their own houses. But their houses weren't safe. There were no walls. And so Ezra helped them build the wall. And then, but they didn't, have, they didn't rebuild the temple. And so Nehemiah came back. And when Nehemiah encouraged them to rebuild the temple. Amen. And so what happened is uh, the people, having been in Babylon for so long, they were sort of estranged. It's been a while since they heard the scriptures or knew the scriptures. In fact, maybe this entire generation had probably been raised in ignorance of the scriptures. They probably had um, word of mouth from mom and dad and waning enthusiasm. And so he gathered them together to read the word of God together. Amen. So in Ezra chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Jumping to verse 3. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Yes, sir. Ezra chapter 8, I believe. Is it not? You know, it's Nehemiah chapter 8. Sorry about that. I opened the right book in the right chapter. <laughs> in my notes, it says Ezra chapter 8. I don't, I don't know how. Maybe because I saw Ezra. You know, Ezra's doing the action. Ezra's in the book of Nehemiah. Thank you so much for slowing me down there. There we go. So we got the first three verses read. Okay, Nehemiah. I gotta fix that. So, Ezra's, Ezra described stood on the platform of wood, which they made for the purpose. And uh, verse five, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. That's why we sometimes stand when we read the word of God. We're following this example. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. You know, Baruch Ata Adonai, Elohinu Melech HaOlam. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with all their faces to the ground. They were so grateful to hear the word of God. They had a heart for God. They didn't know God very well. They didn't know his word or his will. They didn't know what kind of requirements God had, but they were just so happy to get back and, and do it. Verse 8. And I love this. This is what the role of a pastor is. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. They gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Amen. If you want to be a Bible study teacher or preacher, this is your job. You need to read distinctly from the book and give the sense and help them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. They suddenly discovered there was a huge chasm between them and God. He had lots of instructions, lots of things to do, and lots of things not to do, and they discovered they were doing all the things they shouldn't be doing, and they were not doing the things they should be doing. And they, they cried, they were weeping, they realized we are so far from God. He says, no, he says, this day is holy, don't mourn or weep. Verse 10, then he said to them, go your way, Eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions for those whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat 
and drink and ascend portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. They understood that understanding is step one to having a great relationship with God again. It might be a little shocking to discover how far you are from God, but at least that you understand you can do something about it. And so the people were hearing the word of the Lord for the first time. They honored and respected the word of God. They loved the Lord and they agreed with everything they heard, but they understood that they were so far from God in relationship. And they wanted to mourn and weep because of what they've discovered, but, but they were instructed rather to rejoice because now you know, and knowing is so much better than ignorance. Because at least now we can do something about it. Now we can get some direction. You know, condemnation is crippling. And the devil, he wants to just kick you with it. He wants to just swamp you with condemnation. Because he knows that if he can condemn you, you will just crumple. But joy is inspiring. And they were told to choose joy. Amen. So I'm going to encourage you. Let's use that same philosophy through life, as we go through our walk with God, if we ever find ourselves in a hard spot, choose joy. Don't let condemnation cripple you, but choose joy and come back to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this example, Lord God. It's a peculiar example, but I'm sure they were led of your spirit, Lord God, to, to speak these words and to give this very intriguing encouragement to people who are ready to weep and to mourn, Lord God. Hallelujah. Because they saw that these guys, people had a wonderful heart. They saw that they loved the Lord. They loved the word, but they were just shocked at what they'd heard, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, that we'll also be reminded when we discover that there's a big chasm between us and you. Help us not, Lord Jesus, to do what Judas did. Just forget it. But we, Lord, will choose to rise up with joy knowing that there's hope. And that you are for us and not against us. Help us to take that, Lord, to hope, to hope as well. Help that to be our source of joy. And Lord, help us to be tough. Help us to be strong and help us to be inspired to rise up and do things we've never done before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In fact, I've seen some people who have served the Lord for many years. But they've served him in sort of a selfish way. They've just kind of gone to church and done the right thing. And then they realize, after about 20 years into serving the Lord, you know what, I could have been doing this. And rather than saying, well, I wish I would have started 20 years ago, it's too late now, they started right there. They let the joy of the Lord be their strength, and they were able to enjoy, even though it had a late start, they were able to enjoy a ministry for the Lord. Now, we are humans. Okay, we're humans. We are not resurrected yet. We are fallible and we have this law of sin in our members. Remember Romans, Paul says, I have this law of sin. We call it sinful nature. But Paul called it the law of sin that wants us, our flesh wants us to do the wrong things when our spirit wants to do the right thing. And Jesus even said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you can say, oh me, oh my, that sounds like me. And Paul said, we know in part, he said that twice. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, we know in part and we make mistakes and we hurt people. And we can let this steal our certainty and make us fear whether or not we're going to make it. Can we endure to the end? I don't know. I don't trust my flesh. My flesh is so fickle and so deceiving. And it steals your confidence. And you don't need to have that because you've got Jesus working out for you. If you do... Stumble. The Lord's going to throw some stumbling blocks in your way to make it hard to go back to the world. He's not going to stop you, but he's going to throw some stumbling blocks because he wants you to have a chance to wake up and come back. He's not going to make it too easy. There's going to be people knocking on your door. So you don't need to worry about your certainty. Let's have our certainty in God. I mean, when I was a Baptist, we believed this thing called eternal security, that once you get saved, you can never lose your salvation. And that gave me certainty. Of course, it gives other people certainty. People who love the world had certainty as well. So they would actually indulge in the world. With certainty, they'd still go to heaven. Whereas with me, I was grateful and I was serving the Lord. But then when I came to the truth that we don't have that certainty, that we can depart from God with an unbelieving heart, that stole a little bit of my certainty. But then I looked into it deeper and I can see that God is for us. 
and he's going to make it hard for you. He's with you, and he loves us, and he wants us to make it. So we don't need to let it steal our certainty, okay? I know we're humans, and humans are fallible, but don't let it steal your certainty because you got God on your side. We could also let this steal our confidence. You know, sin makes us feel that we are less anointed and less pure to be a conduit of God's blessings. How many times have you been called on to pray for someone for a healing and you think, oh man, but I've been such a lazy Christian. I haven't read my Bible or I haven't done this or I did something I shouldn't have done. And you feel like you're just going to go and you're going to be like an obstacle, you know, rather than a conduit of electricity. You're going to be a, what do you call those things? That, uh, a resistor. You feel like you're going to be a resistor, a really solid clay resistor where electricity is not going to pass through you at all. And so that, that confidence is stolen, but we don't realize that there's no need for that. Yes, we need to live godly. We need to live right. But you need to realize it's not about you. When you're praying, you're asking God to do something wonderful in someone's life. You're not asking God to use you to do something wonderful. Amen. You can get your life right, but, but don't let it steal your confidence. I, I've seen many people who say, well, brother, I'd love to do something for the Lord, but I've really been a little bit weak here and a week there and a week there. And, and they talk themselves out of a ministry where they could have actually got their life in order while they're uh, stepping out and learning. It takes a long time to get a good skill going, so you've got plenty of time to get back that confidence again and get your life back in order. We can also let this reduce our contribution. So people are losing certainty, they're losing their confidence, and you can also reduce your contribution because of this human life that we're living in. And we're all living in human bodies because feelings of condemnation will cause us to feel unworthy to participate in the church with liberty. Who am I? Woe is me. I'm not worthy. And let me step aside and let the stronger Christians get this job done. Right. But you know, that's not how Paul viewed it. In that same chapter in Romans 7 where he talked about this law of sin, rather than allowing it to disappoint him, he did something different. Now, in the previous verses, he's talking about how, you know, I want to do the right thing, and, and sometimes when I want to do the right thing, I don't do the right thing, and then I don't want to do the wrong thing, but when I don't want to do the wrong thing, I do the wrong thing. He says, I had this crazy thing where this law of sin is, 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 is in, intervening, and I allow it to let me do the things I don't want to do and not do the things I want to do. And he says in verse 24, the culmination of this chapter, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says, probably in the spirit of Ezra, from the book of Nehemiah, he said, but I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to still struggle with this law of sin, but I'm not going to let that get me down. Because my mind is serving the law of God. My mind's got the right direction. My mind has knowledge, so I don't need to feel like I need to lose my certainty. I don't need to lose my confidence. I don't need to lose my contribution. I mean, even the Apostle Paul was in a human vessel. And he understood the trials. He confessed it was difficult. But even in, in light of all that, with his checkered you know, track record, like all the rest of us humans, he said, you know what? I'm going to choose joy in the presence of this human mediocrity. You might see the good side of Paul, I'm not going to let you hear about the bad stuff, but uh, you, know, you might see the good side only. Like when you go on Facebook, and you look at everyone's profiles, and everyone's happy, happy, joy, joy, and you don't realize that they've got the challenges just like you, and they've got, you know, problems like you, and they've got warts like you. You know, we all have zits, and, you know, we all have all these little difficulties in life, and we have uh, failures. All we see is the good, and everybody. He said, there is therefore now no condemnation later on in the book of Romans. No more condemnation. We may not be perfect, but we are members of the body of Christ. Yeah, I know we're humans. We're in human vessels. These human vessels are going to not let us down. Or should I say, they're going to repeatedly let us down. They're not going to let us down in, in, in not bringing us down. But we are in the body of Christ. He says, I'm going to thank God. I'm not going to obsess over my human frailty, but I'm going to obsess over being a member of the body of Christ. There's a work to do. Only humans can do it. So let's do it, Paul says. I'm sure he knew that he wasn't the only one struggling 
with those kinds of struggles, amen? We're humans, and we're struggling, and we falter, but he's not going to let him get him down. Actually, I'll get there in a second. Let's talk about self-condemnation. You know, the blood of Jesus, I love this. Anyone like time travel? The blood of Jesus travels both directions in time when you got baptized in Jesus' name. How's that? It travels both directions, amen? When God created time, he knows no boundaries in the realm of time. Jesus has no boundaries, and his blood knows no boundaries. When you were baptized in the name of Jesus, by faith, in obedience, all of the sins you had ever committed were washed away. All of your past had been suddenly cleansed, removed, tossed into the sea of God's forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, buried in water, buried in the blood to rise no more. All the shame is gone too. All the guilt. You don't need to go in front of church and confess some of the worst things you've done. None of that. You don't need to go to a priest. You don't need to go to the pastor and, and confess all your ugly stuff. No, it's gone. We don't care. It's gone. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation. But the very next day, before lunch, you've sinned already. Oh, no. Now what? Can it be over as fast as it started? Did I really ruin it already? And we had a case like that one time. We won a young lady to the Lord, and after about two weeks, she disappeared. Because she blew it. She thought that she blew it so bad, it was just too big. It was just too bad. And God can't forgive these kinds of things. So she just gave up. You know, the devil loves to play that game where, man, it's too big and too much. You might as well just let the Lord go and save him the embarrassment of having to show you to the door. But let's hear what we read from Lamentations. He says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Incredible. How many of you have thought, you know, if God did zap me with lightning right now, that'd be fair? <laughs> I, I'd say, Yeah, Lord, that's a fair call. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but if you've been a Christian long enough, you've probably had one of those moments. And, and his mercies are just incredible. It's because of his mercies that we're not consumed or zapped because his compassions fail not. He actually loves us. He knows you're in a human body. He knows you've got struggles. and Our minds can play terrible games. Our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. He understands that. But they're new every morning. And then there's a phrase that appears 41 times in the Old Testament. You know how people say the Old Testament God was the mean God back in the Old Testament and a nice God in the New Testament? No. He was a gracious God in the Old Testament too. Here's three verses in succession from Psalms 118. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endures forever. And at the end of the chapter, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. This verse appears 41 times. This little phrase, it's a solid fact. And your criminal record is only as long as today. So if you're trying to keep track of your criminal record, if you're trying to really grasp a hold of your self-condemnation, really you haven't got much to work with. The devil is going to try to tell you it's a week long, it's a month long, it's a year long. He's going to try to make you feel bad, but really you can just wipe, rub it in his nose that every morning his mercies are new and we have a clean slate. Now tomorrow morning with your heart set to serve God, it'll be clean again. Why do we repent? Well, not only to get the sin gone quicker, because we do. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But tomorrow morning we're going to have a clean slate anyways, even if you forget to, to, to repent. So why do we repent? And I think it's to teach our heart how to search our ways and find ways to sin less tomorrow. So if you reflect upon your sins and say, Lord, I'm sorry, it causes you to say, how can I not do this tomorrow? But the lazy Christian might not repent of their sins. And they might do it again tomorrow. 
But the wise Christian who says, that was bad. I need to reduce that. I need to reduce that. I need to reduce that. That's good. Amen. It's not just the man who confesses his sins who prospers, but he who confesses and forsakes his or her sin. Repentance, I believe, is a lesson in holiness that you teach yourself. You and the Holy Ghost collaborate. The Spirit talks with you. And you can learn to perfect holiness. Amen. A life skill you're going to spend the next 30 or 40 years, depending on how long you live or how long it takes for the Lord to come. And I love this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. He talks about these wonderful promises of God. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I love that. Two phrases here, cleanse ourselves and perfecting holiness. We can do that. We should do that. It's expected. If you want to be a strong Christian, if you want to be a wise Christian, if you want to be a powerful Christian, because you can't be a weak Christian if you want to, but to me that's scary. But if you want to be a strong Christian, an intentional Christian, someone who makes a difference in this world while you're here, you will be cleansing yourself and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God promises to cleanse us regularly if we just keep our hearts right. You know, every morning you wake up and you say, I'm going to love my wife. Every morning you wake up, I'm going to serve God. I believe that these are choices we make day by day. He teaches us to improve our performance with a regimen of self-study called repentance. And then we study our weaknesses so we can cleanse ourselves. And the more we mortify, which is a fancy word for saying kill off the desires of the flesh the more we can come alive to Jesus. And it feels incredible when you see yourself having total victory over something that you used to be a slave to. My, that feels good. And you know that wasn't you. You think, wow, that was a God thing. And that was not me. I, don't, I never can do that. But God can do it. And I preached a sermon a couple years ago that I said pretty much, we need to let change take the place of mercy in our lives. Now, I might have preached that in the northern beaches. We need to let change take the place of mercy. Mercy is good. But change is better. Because if you can change, you won't need mercy. You know, David did some terrible things. With Bathsheba. Cheating with Bathsheba. Organizing to get her husband killed. Now, he found grace with God, not just because he was a Christian. Not just because he prayed, I believe, but because he changed. So what is the inspiration to push ourselves harder than the average lazy Christian? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Wait a minute, but you don't realize I sinned. I sinned on purpose. I chose to get forgiveness rather than to get permission. I didn't fall into sin. I hunted it down. I found it. Oh, wicked man that I am. I need to hide. I need to prove my sorrow by hiding like Adam and Eve. I shouldn't apologize today. I need to wait a week so God knows it's a sincere apology. And the devil will give you all these crazy alibis to keep you away from God and not repenting for as long as possible. But if you realize at the moment that there's a chasm in your relationship with God, and you need to just turn right around and let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Say, Lord, I come to you right now, freshly sinned. I'm so sorry. And you can use that time as a growth moment. In fact, how much more will it be a growth moment if you come while it's still hurting your heart, when you're still feeling heartbroken for having, having offended God? Amen. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength to bring you back when you're not feeling in the mood to come back, when you're, or to bring you back when you're feeling like you're not worthy of coming back. Now, what is joy? Is joy happy? It sounds like happy, doesn't it? Like there's happy and sad. There's joy and there's no joy. It's not that at all. I believe joy is kind of like a sense of shalom. A sense of peace and serenity. Like David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I think that was the music playing in the background of his heart. So as he was going through life with highs and lows and scary with Goliath and, and scary with uh, his, his Saul 
trying to hunt him down. When he went through highs and lows, he always had that music playing in the background, the Lord is my shepherd. And that gave him the joy to help push through his Goliath moments and his Saul moments and his own failure moments. We need to let that joy, we need to let that joy be a rock of stability and strength in our lives. Because we're not always going to be happy. And that's okay. There's a time for sadness. Like when my dad died, it was a time for sadness. But you know, I, I just, I had that stability. I had that confidence. I know where I'm going. This is a hard time. It's a sad time. But there's maybe tears in the night, but there's joy coming in the morning. And, so, and that should help us at all times. You might be getting news back from the doctor. That's not good news. Joy will give you the strength to get through that time. In fact, even when you have a victory, it's possible to get too carried away with your victory and get elated and get a little self-absorbed. And hopefully, the joy of the Lord will help bring you back down to earth and say, listen, you know, it's, where does this fit in God's plan for your life? You know, make sure we, we use this for the furtherance of the gospel or for the further development of you so you can actually serve God better. So the joy is always sort of in the background there. If we do it right, we have that joy and that confidence so that whether highs come or lows come, you don't lose, you don't walk, you don't walk away from your foundations. Amen. Too many Christians have dropped out of the church, lied to by Satan. I've sinned too much. I've sinned too big. I've sinned too cold-hearted. I sinned when I wasn't tempted. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve a lightning bolt. And that's the devil talking. That's the devil talking. Amen. So let me remind you, none of us deserve heaven. The kingdom of Israel, and here's a great contrast. I mean, the last time I read the Bible through, I just saw it in more living color than I've ever seen it before. You know, there's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah after the kingdom split, okay? They were side by side. The northern kingdom of Israel had no good kings whatsoever. In fact, if you want to talk about popular kings, they had Ahab and Jezebel. Okay, that was bad news. The northern kingdom of Israel, no good kings. They made their own temple, which God did not like. They tweaked the priesthood, which God did not like. They worshipped false gods and had hundreds, possibly thousands of false prophets. I mean, just in Ahab's day, they slew 450 false prophets. And those were the prophets of Baal. They also had probably hundreds of prophets for Yahweh who were lying false prophets. So there were probably thousands of false prophets and false priests. And God sent the nation of Assyria to capture them and carry them away into captivity. So let's all say the kingdom of Israel was wicked. The kingdom of Israel was wicked. Say it with me. The kingdom of Israel was wicked. Okay, that was a lesson well learned. But then we go down to the kingdom of Judah, and they saw it all happen. Then they started sinning too. Now Judah, the kingdom of Judah, which was two nations, it was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, but Judah was bigger, so they called it Judah. They had some good kings. Maybe you've heard of Josiah or Hezekiah. They had lots of really good kings down in the south. But then they started building high places, and altars for their false gods, which was bad. They also had some false priests to help the people to serve the false gods, which was bad. Then they started building pagan temples and altars inside Solomon's temple. Wow, that's very bad. Then they started sacrificing their babies through the fire to the god Molech. Staggers my imagination. The kingdom of Judah did more wickedly than the kingdom of Israel after they saw what happened to the kingdom of Israel. And then God said, you've even done more wickedly than the Canaanites that I kicked out before you. This land spewed out the nations because of their wickedness, and now I've got to spew you out too. And here's the kicker. God still extended mercy to those who would repent. Okay? 
Israel was in thick. They were up neck deep in sin. He says, listen, if you repent, I will protect you. Do you think your sin is so bad that you, are, that you better hide from God? Who does the devil think he is lying to you that God won't forgive you? You want to hide your face, you experience guilt, and you want to hide. Now don't rejoice that you sinned, but rejoice that you're miserable for your sin. Be miserable and then thank God you're miserable. Amen. That's a great place to be. In fact, I'm going to take you to an example of that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 well, it was very informative. But if you read between the lines, there was a lot of sin going on in 1 Corinthians. In fact, a lot of the Baptists who don't like speaking in tongues, who don't like miracles and the gifts of the Spirit, they say, oh, but it was a very wicked church. So they sort of associate wicked church with gifts of the Spirit, and then they shove it all out the window. Lousy logic, absolutely. But while Paul was informing him about the gifts of the Spirit, he was also dealing with them about their sins. And then in the second Corinthians chapter 7, he talked about how that affected them. He said, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow re produces repentance, leading to salvation, which is never to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world, which I call self-condemnation, produces death. Now, what did the Jews have in Nehemiah chapter 8? They had sorrow. And it was godly sorrow. And they were getting ready to respond like it was a sorrow of the world. But Ezra says, wait a second, no. This is good sorrow. This is good sorrow. You need to go home and rejoice. Yes, you are 10,000 miles away from God relationally. But we can fix that because you want to fix that. It bothers you. I'm so glad it bothers you. Can you imagine preaching the gospel to someone and they don't care? And then someone else starts crying because they realize I'm so far from God. My sins have, have, have done, I've done a terrible thing in God's. Who, who's the preacher going to be rejoicing over? The person who has no compassion whatsoever and they're actually happy with themselves? Or the person who's crying because they realize that they're a sinner and they've offended God? Oh my, that person's got so much hope, don't they? That person's got so much hope. And how many times is that you? How many times is that me? We've got sorrow all for the right reasons. Now, it's not good that we sin, but it's good that we have sorrow. We can see the shore. We can see hope. The Lord's calling us. Yeah, I'm still here. Come on in. Just start rowing. Just start swimming. Amen. And so we continue. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. You guys says, man, we got to search our hearts. What are we doing wrong? Okay, we gotta, we got we got to take care of this, and we got to take care of this, and we got to take care of this, and we got to take care of this. He says, look at you go. What diligence? What clearing of yourselves? What indignation? You know what's indignation? That's when you get angry for sin and jealous for God, and you say, you know what? God deserves better than this. He deserves better than this from me. He deserves better than this from you. He deserves better than this from the whole church. That's indignation. That's good. What fear? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. What vehement desire? What zeal and what vindication? He says, I wrote that letter to you. The parts where I was rebuking you and correcting you, I was really scared, but I saw that you guys got this big holy spatula of godly sorrow, and you slipped it under, and you flipped it over, and you fixed it. You did the right thing. You didn't just sorrow and quit and say, man, we are a bunch of losers. What are we? What are we calling ourselves a church? You didn't do that at all. You had godly sorrow and you fixed it. He said, that's incredible. That's supernatural. And that's what Ezra was rejoicing over in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm going to keep saying that so I remember myself. And we need to remember that, brothers and sisters. If you ever find yourself because the devil's going to be there close by to whisper some great suggestions. And they're terrible. 
They might sound great to you. They might sound fair. They might sound justified. But I want you to ignore him and go with the report of the Lord. Whose report will you receive? We shall receive the report of the Lord. So we're going to do that, brothers and sisters. Let's all stand, shall we? I want the joy of the Lord to be yours. I want it to save you. I want it, to, you know, because again, the devil, he likes to play these mind games with us. And sometimes we can fall for them. Amen. We can fall for the trap. And I pray that you'll be strong and you'll have this ammo up your sleeve saying, you know what? When the people of Israel discovered they were 10 miles away from God, they didn't sorrow and weep and wail and mourn and, and, and abandon ship. They ate the fat, drank the good, and they gave gifts to people in need. Amen. And what did Paul say? You responded well. I gave you, in fact, he said, I was afraid. I really was afraid. I didn't know how you were going to respond to this. I was really hard a couple times here. He says, but now I'm glad that I was because you guys responded in a godly way. It was a win, a win for you and a win for me and a win for the world when the church realizes that God is for them. God is with you. God is patient. His mercies are new every morning. He wants you to have confidence. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your patience and your confidence, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You are a gracious God. Hallelujah, Lord God. And I pray that we will always have a heart to serve you. We'll always have a heart to love you, Lord God, and, and not let our grief overwhelm our love, Lord Jesus. Help not our guilt to overwhelm our love. Help nothing to get between it, Lord Jesus. Help us to realize that you love us so much. That's why you've given us the word. You've given us the promises. And that's why you give us the hard news that we need to hear once in a while. You're not here to pat us on the head, but you're here to give us challenges. I know all through my life, Lord God, once every one or two or three or five years, you'll bring up something big that I never dealt with and I have to deal with it. And I thank you that you didn't bring them all up at once at the beginning, but you just kind of space them out, Lord God, so we can, we can rise at a challenge and grow, arise at a challenge and grow, arise at a challenge and grow, and then we can help others with similar problems later. So Lord Jesus, help us to see these corrections, Lord God, as opportunities to grow in you, opportunities to grow wise, in fact, opportunities, Lord Jesus, to serve others who might be going through similar things, Lord God. Help them not to abandon ship but help them to hang in there, Lord Jesus.